Welcome to Second Tech, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Finance Minister Malusi Gigaba delivered his maiden medium-term budget policy address this week, which showed South Africa's current fiscal and economic predicament. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss some of the key themes. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Firstly, the MTBPS included some unhappy news on the fiscal front. Yes, uh, the chickens associated with South Africa's political paralysis really came home to roost in this uh, medium-term budget policy statement. We can see that because of uh, um, South Africa's political crisis, we've decoupled from the rest of the world in terms of growth. So while the rest of the world is back onto a growth path, South Africa is bu uh, sort of bumping along sideways at below 1% growth and this year uh, as everyone expected, the National Treasury used the, the MTPTS to update the growth forecast down to 0.7% um, uh, for the year, which is more or less in line with what World Bank and the IMF have said, uh, which is, but it's quite well below what um, Pravin Gordon said in February around 1.3%, which is nothing, it doesn't shoot the light side in any way. So growth is a problem in a, in a low growth trap. And the, this is having serious implications for uh, the fiscal balance. Uh, so what we've seen immediately is a shocking um, uh, widening in the deficit. In February, we were told it was going to peak at around 3.5% this year. Um, and now we hear it's going to be 4.3%. And what this really implies is a, a massive rise in the debt burden for South Africa, which uh, was going to peak, we, we thought, uh, when Pravin Gordon was giving his uh, uh, um, budget address at around 50% of GDP. It's now going to peak at around 60% uh, of GDP in the early 2020s. And that's really a, a debt burden, uh, you know, it's over 3 trillion rand of debt that's going to be, I think it's 3.5 trillion rand of debt that's going to be on South Africa's books. And that means our, uh, the, the fastest growing item on South Africa's budget from now on is no longer going to be the good, the good things of education or so, so, uh, health or security. It's going to be uh, the, the, the servicing of that debt. So we're going to see that rising to 15% of, uh, uh, of the budget. I think it's around for every um, you know, rand that's going to be spent uh, uh, on expenditure, a good portion, uh, around 15 cents, is going to be going directed towards paying back the debt. So debt's become a major problem. So this is really, really unhappy news for South Africa. And uh, it's actually, it shows uh, really that, you know, if you let things slip on the political front, on the policy front, and you don't deal with your crises around corruption and state-owned companies, it eventually is going to come back and bite you. And where, it's, uh, where this low growth is really biting now is on the revenue line. So SARS is going to collect 50 billion Rand, 50 billion rand less uh, this year than what it estimated in February. Uh, that leaves us with a gaping hole uh, to fill, and South Africa is now having to look at different remedies to fill that. Obviously, the medium-term budget policy statement, we never get a tax outlook at that point. All those sort of personal finance implications on sin taxes and personal income tax um, and corporate income tax and dividend taxes, all those things are held for the, the actual budget. But we know that uh, so, uh, the, what's very clear from that is there's a gaping hole that has to be closed. And you either close this by cutting back uh, on expenditure massively, um, or you're going to have to raise taxes. Uh, and then there's the third option of selling assets. And I think all three are now being looked at more seriously. Gigawa did indicate that government is willing to look beyond taxes to close those budget holes. Yes, I think th that is the subtle shift. I think uh, there weren't many positives from this uh, uh, mini budget, but I think one of the, the, s the positives was that, you know, uh, the, the burden on the taxpayer is heavy, um, and um, cutting back on social expenditure in the context of such inequality um, uh, and poverty is going to also be uh, socially unsustainable. So. I think there is a view, um, and it's a, it's a shift that's been slowly coming under Pravin Gordon, but I think was articulated more strongly in this uh, mini-budget, was that we have to look at other sources uh, of finance. 
and obviously to close the immediate, uh, pro uh, to, to meet the immediate debt ceiling, there's a potential of breaching that by nearly 4 billion rand by the end of this year. There's an immediate um, uh, looking to some of the uh, assets within government's control and the uh, most liquid and most obvious one being the telecom shares. And there is going to be a disposal program there. So about a government holds nearly 40%, I think around 39% of telecom. Um, it gets good dividends from telecom every year, but it also there's a potential to sell down, if not all, some of those shares to plug the immediate gap for, for this year. I think the indication was that they, they're not planning to sell all, all of the stake. Uh, which could uh, bring in, depending where the tr shares are trading, up to 20 billion rand, but uh, rather sell a portion of that stake. And uh, then there's this option to possibly buy back at some point, which uh, looks uh, you know, like something very far away if we're ever to do that. But I think what's on the agenda is not just taxes, not just cutting uh, expenditure, although I think cutting expenditure is going to be something that uh, citizenry would like to see, especially wasteful expenditure. But you can only cut so much back without hurting your, the fiscal framework is really about, uh, largely about redistributing from rich to the poor. And you don't want to hurt that too much because of unemployment at 27%, you know, the huge inequalities in South, in South Africa at the moment, the huge poverty, you know, taking uh, a lot of that money away is going to cause too much pain, I think, for society and social unrest, ultimately. So I think that looking at assets uh, that sit within the government's portfolio, there is obviously a study underway about what is a core asset, what is a non-core asset. But what was also uh, interesting was that uh, um, Melissa Gagaba gave the indication that they won't only look at non-core assets. They will look at some of the core assets. They still see SAA, I think, which ri raises many people's eyebrows as core and as a strategic asset. Um, and th even there, I think the, there's 10 billion bailout immediately, which is not going to go down well with anyone seeing what SAA's performance has been over the last few years. But there's the 10 billion bailout. But with that bailout was a, um, an announcement that uh, the, well, the, it has been in, sort of mooted before, but we now know for sure that there will be a consolidation of the state's airline assets. Uh, that would be SAA and South Africa Express. Over the, uh, once, once this new board is in place at SAA and once, I suppose, everyone can have the, the, the strategy meetings and discussions that are necessary. And once that consolidation happens, there will also be a move to inject a strategic equity partner. One to, I suppose, help with some capital injection to help with the turnaround plan there. And, but two, I think most importantly, is going to be to inject the, the skills necessary to turn around that airline. If it, if it indeed is at all possible to turn around, I think it's been left for so long that uh, I suppose to expect the strategic equity partner to be giving a lot of money uh, is, is, you know, is unlikely, but really to inject the skills needed to turn it around. But whether the, the, all about the constraints placed on both the new management team, the new board, and the strategic equity partner. If they're not allowed to do the, the things they need to do to, to probably shrink the business to profitability, then it's going to be very, very difficult. Things are only likely to get better with growth. Did the MTBPS give any hope on this front? I think the trust deficit and the political paralysis really was the big overhang here. So even though the right words were said and there was a, there's a need to, to, you know, obviously look beyond fiscal consolidation, which is almost out the window with these uh, sort of uh, burgeoning deficits, um, and to look to a new growth path, that those words were said, but they don't come across as credible as they did say in February, where Pravin Gordon was able to say that with the backing of the social partners very much in his camp. Um, so I, d I think that uh, the gap between the words uh, and the aspirations and the actual ability to implement is, is something that worries everyone. And that political paralysis is going to remain with us at least until December. Now, uh, the ANC then has the elective conference. The outcome of that is going to be critical um, to whether there's a mood shift in the country. And it's far too early to say whether that 
mood shift is a definite um, post, the, uh, post the Johannesburg Conference of the African National Congress. But uh, w what we can see is this tidal wave of risk um, uh, and tidal wave of um, sort of political paralysis that is, uh, is hitting the, our shores that is really making it difficult for anyone who's looking at to invest in the country or to expand their business to do so. So I think, no, I don't think on that front, I don't think the box was ticked. I think it was important though not to have an ostrich approach. And I think uh, Gigaba didn't have an ostrich approach. He, he laid the cards on the table. It was ugly, uh, it, it's a dire outlook. And I think he also laid the cards out. I think some people thought very ironically, <laughs> given his role in the appointment of some of these boards but, uh, at state-owned companies, but in terms of needing to turn around having ethical and credible boards and management teams at places like SAA and ESKIM. And I think it was important that he highlighted the risk that ESKIM poses to this economy. Um, it's got a massive debt burden of itself. Most of that is guaranteed by the government. And there is a threat, uh, given where ESKIM is at, that those guarantees, which are currently put down as contingent liabilities for the uh, National Treasury and for the budget, can become uh, real, uh, real liabilities. And the contagion effect of that, I think, could be serious on uh, both on the fiscal balance, but just on the economy and the outlook for the economy. So this whole issue of getting our economy growing again, I think we're not really uh, past that point. This didn't take us in much further in terms of that. But I, uh, but I think that uh, there's, there's these key uh, events that are coming up uh, later this year that will be uh, the key, s the, the important swing factor in whether the, the confidence, which Gigaba rightly said is the, the cheapest form of stimulus for this economy, where the confidence returns much hinges on what happens in December at the ANC conference. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.